Very good. Okay, so I think we can begin now with uh, today's uh, Sutta class. So usually we do the Namo Tassa out of respect that these are the word of the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sankang Namasami. So again, welcome to this uh, session of the uh, Word of the Buddha. And uh, this is a retranslation of a very well-known book, uh, first of all, uh, written by Venerable Jnana Taloka, and uh, republished over 100 years, and this is an updated translation. And I think I'm uh, very good that the, uh, the team over here uh, remembered that the last time, two weeks ago, we just finished off the, the jhanas. Not that you can finish off the jhanas, they're amazing things, but at least uh, gave you a description of them. And now we come up to the summing up of the Noble Eightfold Path. Is that correct? Good, yeah. So remember this whole um, anthology of teachings of the Buddha. It's an anthology, it takes a piece here, a piece there, a piece there, somewhere else, to actually to describe the Four Noble Truths. And of course, the Fourth Noble Truth is the Eightfold Path. So the whole book is just a very powerful um, <coughs> skeleton, the main sort of uh, uh, framework on which all the other teachings um, uh, uh, are added onto. And it's very powerful just to know the basic teachings of Buddhism, uh, the eight, Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And of course, we're summing up the Noble Eightfold Path. This is that middle way awakened to by the Buddha which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. Enter then upon this path and you make an end of suffering. So first of all, it's a middle way because they always kept on saying it avoids the extremes of indulging in the five senses and also the extreme of uh, doing practices, negative practice, which literally tire and exhaust the body and the mind. So it is a happy path. And it just, it's this um, statement, it gives rise to vision, to knowledge, leads to peace, direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nibbana. Those are the five things which they keep on saying that if something is leading in that direction, then it is leading in the path, it must be the teachings of the Buddha, it must be the, the Dhamma. That was this saying which was given to Mahapajapati, the first bhikkhuni, and also to Upali, who was uh, the one who uh, was a Vinaya, the training expert. And so if anything leads to those things, to vision, in other words, not, not needing spectacles anymore, it means that inner vision, uh, insight to knowledge, not knowledge which you, you read in books, but knowledge which you get from your own direct experience, which leads to peace, which is an important thing here because people can argue what vision is, insight is, knowledge is, but peace is something which uh, you, know, you can't really mistake. To direct knowledge, which means your own experiential knowledge, to enlightenment to Nibbana. Enter upon that path and you make an end of suffering. Now, of course, Nibbana, what is Nibbana? So, they give a few descriptions here of Nibbana. When you know and see thus, the mind is no longer pulled out into the world of the five senses. It is liberated from the wanting, asawa. These are the three asawas. Now, sometimes they're called taints, sometimes they're called cankers. But its literal meaning is actually something which actually flows out or flows in. And you know, the, the etymology of that can be either. But I prefer, personally, the idea of flowing out, 
like the mind, you know, it's very happy inside, especially if you've got some good meditation. Then it just flows out into the past, into the future, into the world of the senses. It doesn't stay home. It's just like going through airports, which I always tend to do a lot of these days. You're trying to just be nice and peaceful, and then you have to run the gauntlet of alcohol shops, perfume shops, and people trying to sell you latest electronics, and you know you, that they make it so you have to go through those those shops, and it was like running a gauntlet with people saying, "Hello, sir, would you like to try?" That actually happened to one of the monks once. Uh, they were, had a type of perfume, and it's called samsara perfume, <laughs> literally, and he said, "Would you like to try some?" <laughs> or something, it's crazy stuff. Anyway, but <laughs> but this is the, the ask which pulls you out from where you are. It no longer flows out just to be. This is the being asawa. And that is saying some very profound understandings that sometimes that we, we go out in the world to enjoy our five senses and sometimes we go out in the world just just to exist. It's as if if we stay home and then we don't do anything, we just disappear, that we sort of don't exist anymore. And this is the idea you go out to be, to say I'm here, to say that I am something. And I did see yesterday, uh, I, was it the, no, it was actually just uh, at the morning dana. There was a young girl who actually had on her t-shirt, I am a nobody. And I wanted to see if she had on the back of the t-shirt, the, the last part of that uh, little saying, I am a nobody, nobody's perfect, therefore I am perfect. That great logical uh, <laughs> argument. <laughs> but so anyway, you can have perfection by disappearing. So anyway, this is from the, the wanting to be somebody. It's why sometimes people just want to sit in the front, just want to put their hands up, want to do something, just say, here I am, listen to me. It's actually a, uh, it's, an, uh, it's an outflow. And it no, so it no longer froze, it no longer pulled out. I changed the words, so pulled out into the world of the five senses. These five senses are almost like pulling you out. Now try me, taste me. And it no longer flows out just to be, and it no longer leaks out because of delusion. So I use a few little different words. It still means going out, but I use a different word for the different types of these uh, outflowings, which you know is another way of looking at what keeps you into samsara, keeps you getting reborn, keeps you from being enlightened. So five senses doesn't bother you, doesn't pull you out. It doesn't flow out just because you want to say, here I am, I exist. And it no longer leaks out because of delusion. It is liberated from the delusion, outflowing. When liberation occurs, the knowledge of liberation invariably follows. And I often like putting that down, because it's not as if that you are enlightened, you don't know it. That the two will happen automatically, they will come afterwards, yes, you know that rebirth is finished. There is no more of existence for you. It is uh, knowing. Of course, many people think they're enlightened, they're not. But you can't be enlightened and not know. So you understand, birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done had been done. There is no more re rebirth or reappearance in any state of existence. So your deliverance is unshakable, this is your last life. Now there'll be no more renewal of existence. For this is the su supreme noble wisdom, namely the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering. And the true goal. So this holy life does not have gain honor and fame for its main purpose, or the attainment of virtue for its main purpose, or the attainment of jhana as its main purpose, nor insight for its main purpose. Those are just means to the end. 
The main purpose of the holy life is this unshakable deliverance of mind, full enlightenment. That is the goal of this holy life, its essence and its culmination. So all these things are important. You do cultivate virtue, the jhanas, the insight, but those are there to lead to full enlightenment. And especially the gain, honor and fame. I always say that uh, religious people should be really careful of gain, honor and fame. The Buddha um, saw that as in a dream, as like having his head on a dung pit, a pile of dung. And he said that was gain, honor and fame. So that's why, uh, please, do not give money and funds to the monks or to the nuns. Give them to the temple, fine, but not to the monks, not gains. Honors, yeah, they can give you awards, but you don't sort of make too much of them. That's why I gave uh, an account at a talk I gave in, it was in Singapore, beyond ultimate truth. What do you mean, beyond ultimate means? You can't go beyond the ultimate. But of course, as human beings, we can. Because uh, when you're a monk, an ordinary monk, you know, you just call yourself venerable. But in some conferences I go, you get to be called most venerable. And if after a few more years, you become even more most venerable, extremely most venerable or the supremely extremely most venerable. <laughs> and it just gets so ridiculous. You know, that's not what you've got a monk for. <laughs> uh, so the other one, they, I think you all know that after 20 years you are called Mahatera. No, after 10 years, you're called Terra. After 20 years, Mahatera. And that's usually as far as it goes. But I thought, well, if you're going to go Mahatera, what do you get after 30 years as a monk? So it should be Megatera. After 40 years, Gigatera. Now I'm 43 years as a monk now, so that's why I'm happy, because Giggle Terra. And of course, after 50 years, you're Terra Terra. <laughs> you can see just how there's fame just you know, causes a lot of problems in our world. And what else have we got over here? Uh, fame and gain, honor, fame. That's it. Gain, honor, and fame for its main purpose. So it's not, that's not the point. So it's the main purpose of the holy life is the unshakable deliverance of mind, full enlightenment. That is the God of holy life. And it may be that you will think, this was just before the, the Buddha passed away, the teacher's instructions has ceased. Now we have no teacher. Just the Buddha was about to pass away. It should not be seen like this. For what I have taught and explained to you was Dhamma and discipline. The, the discipline is Vinaya, the Dhamma is the suttas. Will at my passing be your teacher? Now that was an amazing little saying because, you know, many times that uh, people think, oh, why did not the Buddha um, anoint a successor in his lineage? Who would be the teacher after the Buddha passed away? And he said, there will be no anointed teacher. The Dhamma and the discipline, that will be your teacher. For it should not be seen on this. For what I have taught and explained to you is Dhamma and discipline will at my passing, that will be your teacher. And what that meant, no popes, no archbishops, no patriarchs, matriarchs. So all the ideas of Sangharajas, uh, Mahanayakas, uh, Dalai Lamas or whatever, that was added much after the time of the Buddha. So the teachers, the boss, is not myself, not Mahanayakas or Sangha, uh, not um, uh, Sangharajas. The boss would always be the teaching of the Buddha, the Dharma and the discipline. And that, that straight away took away all the possibilities of what happens when you have a power concentrated in one place. So you should live as islands unto yourself. 
being your own refuge when no one else is your refuge, with the Dharma as your island, with the Dharma as your refuge with no other refuge. Now that's also a very powerful thing because sometimes that we, you know, we get sucked into to, uh, being a disciple of a guru. So no, live as an island yourself, with the Dhamma as your island, with your refuge. So your own wisdom, rather than just, uh, and the Dhamma, which you see in the, uh, the suttas, that is the most reliable thing. And the idea, it's not mentioned here, but I always like to add, that when we go for refuge, we go to refuge, the three refuges, to the Buddha, to the Dhamma, and who else? To Ajahn Brahm? No. <laughs> to Sayadaw, uh, whatever? No. To some Guru Rinpoche? No. To uh, Ayahasapanya? No. Not to bhikkhunis, not to monks. We go to refuge to the Sangha. It's a wonderful thing because otherwise if we just commit to one person that can be very dangerous. You're lucky if you have a good teacher but your refuge is to the Sangha. So anyway, for this reasons those matters that I have discovered and proclaimed this is the Buddha speaking should be thoroughly learned by you this is what hopefully you're doing here. Practice, developed and cultivated. Not just learned, but practiced. To find out if it works. If it doesn't work, you know, see if it's the teachings are wrong or that you haven't really understood them. That might be the reason that they're wrong. They're not working. Developed and cultivated. So that this holy life may endure for a long time. This is how holy life endures for a long time. This is by uh, learning, practice, developed and cultivated. That's how the Dhamma in places like Sri Lanka and Burma are kept going. And I say that's a political point because there are some, a vast minority think that in order to preserve Dhamma you have to break your precepts and just destroy other people's property or even kill people. This is totally against what the teachings are. It says to actually to protect Dharma so it will uh, so that it may be for the benefit and happiness of the multitude out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of uh, heavenly beings and humans so it will last a long time. How, how will it last a long time? is actually by learning it, practicing, developing and cultivating it. So that's, you know, what sometimes you have the time to put in the newspapers, stop all the violence which happens. The Buddhists, they're not really Buddhist nationalists, uh, or very deluded people, I must admit I would say that, who are, uh, are creating violence in some of these countries. For the benefit and happiness of devils and humans. So anyway, now, just, okay, you got a question already? Okay. Yeah, well, any questions on that before we go further? The, until we get to the Simsapa um, assembly, which is really powerful. Yes. Uh, Ajahn, so that Dhammapada stanza. Yeah. So be your own refuge. Yeah. That refers to lines. Yeah. Does that mean... Practicing to, practicing to the stage of entering the stream? Ah, no, it... it what, you, does that, what does that mean? Be your own refuge is, is actually don't just follow other people. In other words, argue, ask questions, debate, discover. Just don't just be gullible and believe others. Don't rely on sort of others because there are many charismatic sort of teachers in this world and some of those charismatic teachers oh, you know, I've been around long enough to see some of these and they are such shams and they destroy so many people's faith and uh, I don't want to get political at all but I remember reading uh, about three or four months ago there was a, a, a guru in the Punjab 
called the Guru of Bling. And I don't know if you saw that little article. Um, he wore designer clothes. He had this really amazing Harley Davidson bicycle. And he, uh, he, um, he produced his own movies in which he starred. <laughs> and he was a total um, billionaire. And of course, you know, eventually they found out that you know, he was uh, sexually abusing some of his disciples and was put in jail. And he was charismatic, you know, he knew how to speak, but you know, underneath all of that there was you know, much, uh, we say, uh, he left much to be desired. <laughs> so it was a sham, but you see, in time after time people get sort of caught up in that. And they get blinded by, by charisma. And so this is why the Buddha was saying, be careful, just you know, check it out for yourself. Don't just be gullible and just believe because some person just uh, says, believe me. As they say in, in, um, in the West, don't leave your brain outside the temple when you leave your shoes out. Bring your, take, pick, leave your shoes outside, but bring your brain inside. So, I mean, the, the way I'm hearing you is that simply to embrace active learning. Active? Active learning. Yeah, yeah, active learning, yeah. Yes. Mm. And don't just believe and follow. Okay, this, okay. Sorry, Arjun, I haven't been here for all the classes. Um, you're using enlightenment instead of extinguishment. I yes, yes. Just, um, Indeed, that's uh, for different words, different um, contexts. So enlightenment in this particular context is understood. Yes, Ananda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in that, uh, the, you use three different uh, terms as you were saying, Ajahn, yeah. that uh, uh, no pulling out, no flowing out, no leaking out. Oh, yes, yeah. Three asavas. Yeah. Is it because the sensual delight uh, asava is the grossest and the other one is the subtlest? I think so, yes, because the uh, sensual delight, you can, you can actually feel it. it's a good word, you get pulled out. Yeah. So there's some music which I heard when I was a kid and you just get moved out and just get sucked out and just pulled out into it. So the sensual desires are like that. You know, you see this beautiful hot girl or boy or whatever and sometimes, you know, you just, before you even know it, if you haven't got your mindfulness, you get pulled out, you get sucked out, or rather pulled out by these things. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you know, that uh, much psychology into selling products and making them attractive is sort of very, very profound. So it takes a long time to resist that. So it's, this is where you get pulled out by the five senses. And what else do we get sort of uh, uh, flows out to be? So there's, in a sense, there's it's not so involuntary, not so involuntary, but still, you know, you just, you just want to exist. It's a, it's a very deep-seated desire. And it's also the leaking out of delusion. So, yeah, I think it's, a, it's almost uh, different levels, yeah. Different levels. Yeah. Grossest to subtle. Yes. And I think it's great to have these different words, which actually, uh, those words, again, you don't translate words, you translate sentences. And, and thank you, Ajahn. Those three words actually yeah. straight away gave that uh, different yeah. level uh, yeah. existence. Thank okay, you. very so. good. Okay. And other Simsapa leaves. This is one of the greatest of the... Because sometimes people say, oh yeah, yeah, but so this is what the Buddha said, but you know, there's, there's more. Did he have any secret teachings? you know, which were preserved amongst monks or nuns in communities because no other people could understand it at the time? Or was it preserved in some, uh, some uh, Naga realm or Deva realm for so many centuries because no one else could, could understand it? And this is a, a powerful saying. Which do you think are greater? The Buddha asking a community of monks. The few leaves that I hold in my hand are all the leaves in the forest, asked the Buddha. 
the leaves in the forest came the obvious answer. Likewise, the things that I know but have not taught you are many, like the leaves in the forest, whereas the things that I have taught you are few, like the leaves in my hand. So he hasn't taught everything he knew. Ah, there are some secret teachings. So why didn't he teach everything he knew? The last sentence. The reason that I have not taught you these things is because they are irrelevant to the holy life and do not lead to enlightenment. <laughs> so that was again a powerful, yeah, there are other, other, other methods, other teachings, other sort of uh, stuff which the Buddha knew, but he kept it to the purpose of enlightenment. It means that they weren't really relevant at all to enlightenment. So what he taught, he's saying here, is what is relevant to enlightenment. The other things, the great leaves in the forest, rather than the leaves in his hand, those things are not relevant to enlightenment. Make sense? Okay, any questions? Okay, this is similar to Simsar beliefs. So when people say there were secret teachings hidden because people couldn't understand them, the Buddha actually says quite the opposite here. Yeah, there's teachings he didn't say because they're irrelevant. Now, another way of looking at the Eightfold Path is something that they call the gradual training. So this is not different to the Eightfold Path, as I will point out. This is actually just a parallel to the Eightfold Path, a different way of describing the same um, training or path. But because it's a parallel, also taught by the Buddha many times, you can combine these two together to see just how this path to enlightenment works. Eightfold path, gradual training, the same looked at from a different angle. Both taught by the Buddha. So the gradual training. First of all, the rising of the Buddha and the Dhamma. A Buddha appears in this world, accomplished, arahat, fully awakened, samasambuddho, and prefer awaken for a Buddha, because it comes from the Pali word bujati, which does mean to wake up. Because uh, we say enlightenment, that is used for just so many things. They have the enlightenment in, in Western Europe in the 17th, 18th century. But you know, this is something a bit, well actually very different. So, per fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, and I like the fact that whenever there's true knowledge, they say the conduct as well. Uh, well liberated, that's this word, sugato. It literally means well gone. But well gone where? And so I sometimes like this, well liberated. Knower of the world, does that mean that he's a cosmologist? And the answer, those worlds, this the three worlds, and it's not sort of a physical world, because the whole physical world is only just one of those worlds. So the cosmos of a theoretical physicist is only a third of the cosmology of a Buddha. So it is actually the, the, the world of the five senses, the things you can touch and see and hear and smell and taste. That is just stuff. Of course, it does mean just you know, planet Earth with all of its uh, trees and flowers and soil and people and bricks and wood and stuff. But it also means the space, it also means just the uh, solar systems and uh, galaxies and universes. So all of that. But um, that is just one of those worlds. The other world is called uh, the Rupa Loka, that is the Jhana realms. And the other one is the Arupa, which is the immaterial realms. So there's three different types of, of, of places where not just you know, the universe, the stars and galaxies, this is something even more because the Buddha kept on talking about even these uh, physical universes, they come and go. 
and just uh, they have they call sangwata wiwata. Oh no, wiwata first of all. So that's expanding, developing, evolving universes, and then sort of devolving. And the devolving could be something which is uh, the three possibilities. And when I was doing theoretical physics, the big crunch, the big whimper, or just um, there was one in between. And I think that's just a big whimper. In other words, just the whole, um, we know as stuff keeps expanding, 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 until all the stars just die out. No more energy, it just becomes this, this whimpering, just um, stable, just not hot enough for life, nothing left. It is like a fire which dies out. Or it could have, if there's enough mass in this universe, you make it all pull back again into this big crunch. But anyway, even, I always keep on mentioning Stephen Hawking's, he always, uh, he admitted in the end, he was the person responsible for the Big Bang. But uh, eventually he knew that it was before the Big Bang had to happen. So those are that's so only the physical stuff. So people used to ask, what happens when, you know, all of the, the planets, all of the, the uh, galaxies, just uh, un uninhabitable, what happens to human beings? What happens to life as we know it? And that's where he said, well, they get reborn in the jhana realm mostly. Another place of existence, which is not dependent upon stuff. So anyway, it's, uh, and of course the immaterial realm is even more refined. This is what you can taste when you get into the deep meditations. So the rupa and arupa worlds, that's the three worlds the know of the world, it's not just stuff, but the things which are way beyond stuff. Know of the world, incomparable teacher of those who can be taught. Now that gave me a lot of confidence as a teacher when I read that, and I always keep it in mind. Even the Buddha had to admit some people can't be taught. <laughs> so. If I can't teach people, <laughs> I mean, that's, who do I think I am? Even the Buddha admitted that. The incomparable teacher of those who can be taught. Teacher of gods and humans, the awakened one, Buddha, the master, Bhagawa. Because sometimes people call Bhagawa the Lord. I know I came from, from England, you know, when they used to have lords and viscounts and stuff. But in a house of lords, that was like privilege, that was elitism, and no, that didn't really make sense to me. The idea of being a lord and having that taken into religion. Oh, come on, this is supposed to be unworldly, not a place of privilege. So instead of calling it lord, I know there's one fellow who uh, has a bit of fun when he comes to our monastery. He's a very eccentric but very lovable, that's old KC. And many of you come to offer dana, and he's out there saying, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! <laughs> You've seen him before. <laughs> and he's not a Christian, he's, Praise the Lord, Buddha! Praise the Lord, Buddha! <laughs> <laughs> Cheeky, but very good fun. But the idea of like a Lord, I mean, it doesn't make much sense to me. Anyway, there we go. So I, I put that as the, the master. With his own direct knowledge, he has realized this universe with its gods, this world with its beings, and he makes it known to others. Teachers are dumb, are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. With the right meaning, a right phrasing, reveals a perfectly complete and pure spiritual life. So, a Buddha arises in the world. And then, someone or you hear that Dhamma. On hearing that Dhamma, you acquire faith in the Buddha. The faith, as I remember, um, who was it called? Francis Story. He says, what's the difference between Buddhist faith and some of these other faiths you see in this world? And he said, well, Buddhist faith is faith supported by reason. And uh, some other faiths are faith in defiance of reason. And I always like that statement. Faith in defiance of reason and faith supported by reason. So if it's in defiance of reason, it just makes absolutely no sense at all. You know, and then just uh, ignore it, reject it. But if it's faith supported by reason, then okay, go for it. So 
A right. good idea of faith in defiance of reason was some of those, how was it called, Heaven's Gates, who they believed that and one of these um, asteroids was heading to Earth. All the scientists said it will miss Earth by a long way. They say, no, it's going to actually hit Earth. But behind that spacecraft, behind that uh, asteroid, there is, a, there is a spacecraft coming to save all those people who believe in my teachings, said the, their teacher. And of course, but the only way to get on that spacecraft, you had to, to commit suicide just at the right time. And people did, and these were intelligent people, you know, with degrees and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, sometimes the charismatic people, and they can believe because they, their, their faith is not supported by reason. So please, don't leave your brain outside this temple. So, uh, you have faith in the Buddha, possessing that faith, and consider thus. Household life is troublesome and busy. Life as a monastic is free and relaxed. It is not easy while living in a house to lead a holy life utterly perfect and pure. Suppose I shave off my hair, put on the orange robe, and go forth from the worldly life into a monastery. And of course, you know, this is not trying, I'm just translating here what is clearly said. So to have some renunciation. But on that, a personal comment is that some monasteries can be very busy. So, you know, we try to make it so, you know, we can fulfill the Buddha's teachings by making it an easy, uh, less troublesome place to live. So, you know, please excuse us if, you know, sometimes we go on retreats, because otherwise, you know, what's the point of having a monastery if the monks there uh, have to work, even the nuns have to work harder than you people do? There's something very wrong when that happens. So we try and, you know, at least, uh, try and make it not so busy. Otherwise, it might as well stay as a... And people actually do that these days. I've noticed a lot of uh, lay people, they learn how to live a very simple, <coughs> monastic-like life. Few possessions, and living in a small little apartment or room somewhere, and just meditate all day. No TV, no radio, no sort of... Um, and quite frankly, you don't need much to live these days. If you don't want to go traveling, if you don't want to, you don't have a partner or kids, if you don't um, uh, eat simply, and just you know, don't need to live in the best suburb, but you know, a moderate suburb, there is a possibility of living as a hermit. And I often think that the best place for hermits is actually not in the forest, but uh, in the city apartment. A little apartment where no one knows where you are, who you are. The hermits. Interesting idea. Anyway, I always like to think outside the box. So anyway, but for that time, especially even hopefully to make it possible this time in Australia, that, that it becomes obvious that monastic life is much more simple. So suppose I shave off my hair, put on the orange robe, go forth into the world life into a monastery. On a later occasion, having given away all your wealth, abandoning your circle of relations and friends, you shave off your hair, put on the orange robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness, into monastic life. And this important thing about giving away all your wealth before you become a monastic, because otherwise, they're just, you know, you're not really a, a monastic anymore if you have the money and the wealth. You can get whatever you want whenever you want it. So what's the difference? But the thing about being uh, poor in poverty as a monastic is that, that uh, you can be admonished in the sense that these monks of Kosambi, they had a big argument and even the Buddha couldn't sort of uh, settle it. So the lay community, they stopped feeding them for a week. If those monks had money, of course, you know, they could have bought their own food. But because the lay community refused to feed these monks for seven days, after seven days, those monks, they had to <laughs> resolve their differences because they were hungry, they were starving. <laughs> and they came to their senses and they, they made amends. 
for those important that you do have some power over the Sangha. If we do the wrong thing, don't feed us. Starve us. Please do that, because that's the only other way is that monks and nuns will do whatever they want. And you know, you don't have any sort of leverage over them. So that's when you give away your wealth. You're dependent. Dependent on the kindness of others. People will always be kind to you, they will look after you when you practice as a good monk or as a good nun. They will always look after you, don't have anything to worry about if you're a good monk or good nun. If you're not a good monk or good nun, that's where you have leverage over them to make sure that they realize what they should be doing. But another little thing about abandoning all your wealth, because sometimes in the West, that's like when somebody becomes a novice, and when that's when they can't have any wealth, it's like stripping their assets. It's like asset stripping. So sometimes people think, okay, you become a nun, and then you get ordained, and you've got to give all your assets away, and then ha ha ha, we've got your money. The Buddhist Society of West Australia, great asset stripper. <laughs> we don't do that. So the advice is, because sometimes, uh, you know, what happens is life, people start to uh, get very inspired to become a monk or a nun, and then they leave. And they're not any fault of themselves. They gave it a try, they did everything they could, but, you know, it wasn't for them. So, what we usually do, just to let you know what our standards are, if you do become a monk or a nun, then you know, once you are ordained, you make sure beforehand all your assets, usually called like liquidated, I think is the word, so put into one, into one sort of bank account, and say it's, uh, say it's under Ainsley Hazelgrove, you decide to become a monk, Ainsley. So that money is in a bank account, Ainsley Hazelgrove. And that's, uh, but once you become a monk, you've got a different name. You know, you're a venerable, um, what's it, Agapanya. I just made that name up. Great wisdom. <laughs> or Mahap well, Agapanya means the, the chief of wisdom. And then, venerable Agapanya, you can't access that because it belongs to Mr. Ainsley Hazelgrove. So it just sits there for a while until, you know, well, after three, four, five years, if you decide you're going to stay as a monk, because by that time, you know, you get to understand what's it, what it's all about, and you can remain like that. And if that's the case, then you give it away. But I made this rule, it's not the Vinaya, but I think it's a very wise rule, that if by that time, you know, you want to, to leave, you can't give, oh, you want to, sorry, if that time you want to stay as a monk, you can't, give all those assets to the monastery in which you live. Somewhere else, anywhere else. It could be a nun's monastery, it could be overseas monastery, it could be to the Save the Children Fund or whatever, but not to the monastery in which you live. So you don't benefit from it. When you are ordained, you renounce and that's it. It's just in case that you do disrobe, then it can come back to you. So that's actually how we use it. So it's not can never be regarded as asset stripping. But anyway, you give away your wife, abandon your circle of relations, friends, share off your hair, put on your orange home, go forth from the home life into homelessness. Into monastic, uh, sorry, into monastic life. Any questions about that? Just went off the subject a bit with something interesting. Is that quite clear? Okay. Are you going to do it then? Is it you going to ask? Sorry. Are you, are you going to come? <laughs> You make it sound too tempting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some monks have to disrobe because of ill health. Oh, no, that's, that's true, yeah. So sometimes that's a case of, in some monasteries, you know, especially very well established monasteries, you know, we try and make sure that you know, they have the opportunity to be looked after. But, you know, when you have young monasteries, especially in places like Australia, infrastructure is not there. And it's difficult to look after monks when they get to very, very ill health. But, we, you know, hopefully in the future, and if a person's ordained in a monastery and they've 10, 20, 30 years, then, you know, it's our responsibility to look after them. They may have to go into, 
in the hospitals for many, many days or whatever. But hopefully they could be looked after in-house. Just like Ajahn Chah, you know, he didn't have to disrobe when he had his stroke. Still stayed there. And hopefully there are many other. This is one of the things we, we always have to discuss about how to look after you know, elderly and sick monks. So, you know, they can be cared for. In the early days, of course, it was really tough. We didn't have that in infrastructure. But hopefully that these days that we can look after people much better. You got over here? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Ajahn Brown. Um, just coming back to your point about realms, uh, you described in your previous okay. talks yeah. as uh, time being curved. Uh, you yeah. said about not flat timers, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, if time does curve back around to this point, ah, that we, we, we go through the big crush and the big yeah. bang happens, we come back to this point again. If you achieve enlightenment, would you still, once the universe reborn, would you then be reborn in this realm? That's a good question, but most of time is uh, part of the first world, Rupa Loka, stuff. Yeah. That's why, you know, that is it the same sort of time as in the, the Rupa realm and the Arupa realm, the other two worlds? Because that was a big thing with, um, with uh, Einstein's special theory. You know, that you'd never call it space anymore, you'd call it space time. In like a four dimension where time is just part of, of space, almost created by space. Mm. So do you think that um if we did come around again, do you think uh, that, that other the, thing, yeah. the Buddha what? would be reborn? Yeah. <laughs> no, this is it's another type of, of uh, coming round again. But it's uh I refine that idea of space being curved by imagine an elastic band which is curved, it's a ring but it's expanding so fast there's no way you can get round to where you started still curved but expanding and that's precisely the same with a physical space yeah it's curved, there's no edge to it but there's no way to actually to go so fast that you know you can just you know, come back to where you started. It's just like when you rush after it, the thing goes further away, the edge. And so it's expanding so much, impossible to come back to where you started. Thank you. Unless, of course, there's always exceptions. Doctor Who, Doctor Who could do that. <laughs> Remember Doctor Who in the TARDIS. <laughs> That was going when I was a kid. Apparently, it's still going on. It's amazing. It just shows you how it. Probably the episodes go round and round and round and round. <laughs> That's why I repeat my stories. You know, it's just. <laughs> Is there another question? So, yeah, over there. This one. Ajahn, in this passage, you talk about um, abandoning family and friends when going into the um, monastic life. I want. I wondered um, if you could comment on how you can negotiate this in a wise and compassionate way, so it's not so much an, an abandon, I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're talking renouncing about... Of um, becoming a monk. Becoming a monk, renouncing. Yeah, what it is that uh, you do, uh, having given away all your wealth, abandoning your circle of relations and friends, it doesn't mean you... Abandoning doesn't mean you just totally say, like, this one monk I ordained with in, in Thailand, it was, it was actually crazy, it didn't last that long. He wrote to his mother uh, in England from Thailand, from Ajahn Chah's monastery, Mum, I'm now a monk, regard me as dead. <laughs> Imagine your mother receiving a letter like that. <laughs> he was absolutely mad. <laughs> but, Anyway, later on he sort of disrobed and he got reincarnated back into his family again. <laughs> but, but anyway, that alternative to that is one of the monks I grew up with, I was sat next to him, he was about one or two months ordained before me. He's a, 
Oh, I don't mind saying his name, Ajahn Fira Dhamma. And very nice monk, very friendly Canadian. Canadian, but uh, I think in Latvia and was, uh, his family were in Latvia and they, uh, during the Second World War when the Russians invaded Latvia or something, they fled to Germany and then eventually got uh, resettled in Canada. But his mother got very sick. So uh, his brother couldn't look after him, so he decided to do um, some compassion and go look after his mum. And it was only just you know, until she died because she was that sick. And it took about 23, 24 years before his mother died and he looked after all that time. And it's really a nice you know, example. You know, he kept his precepts, he could not sort of um, uh, handle any money. So his brother set up accounts in this shop and that shop and he didn't even cook for his mum when she was that sick. Looked after her, cared for her. It was a wonderful, compassionate thing he did. and. Uh, for those, uh, but we only thought it was just a temporary thing, only for a couple of months, because his mother was close to dying. With that sort of care, you know, she perked up and he was there for, for so many years. Eventually she passed away and so now he's got a nice monastery. You know where his monastery is? It's in Canada, in Ontario, in a small town called Perth. <laughs> Perth, Ontario. There's something about this word Perth. But I mention that because that's possible. So it is not as if that you know you just totally renounce your family responsibilities. But you know you just you know that was an extreme case. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, inspiring. Okay. Um, so you you're in monastic life or just even a spiritual life. Now the virtue. So, now this is important here. The virtue, when you have gone forth, you trade in the monastic way of life. You abstain from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciful, you live compassionate to all living beings. You abstain from taking what is not given, taking only what is given, wanting only what is given, by not stealing, you abide in purity. You abstain from all sexual activity. Living apart from the others, you abstain from the lay practice of sexual intercourse. You abstain from false speech. You speak only the truth. You are trustworthy and reliable. You are no deceiver of the world. You abstain from divisive speech. You do not tell tales in order to divide people, but you are one who reunites those who are divided a promoter of friendships, who enjoys harmony, rejoices in harmony, delights in harmony, a speaker of words that promote harmony. You abstain from harsh speech. You speak only words that are gentle, pleasing to the air and lovable, words that go to the heart, are courteous, desired by the many and agreeable to the many. You abstain from useless speech. You speak at a proper, proper time, speak what is truthful, Speak what is beneficial, speak on the Dharma and the training, at the proper time you speak words that are worth treasuring, authoritative, succinct and beneficial. You abstain from injuring seeds and plants. You practice eating only in the morning, abstain from eating at night outside the proper time. You abstain from dancing, singing, music and movies. You abstain from wearing adornments, fragrances and cosmetics. You abstain from using luxurious furnishings. You abstain from accepting money. You, accept, you abstain from accepting raw grain and raw meat. You abstain from accepting servants and slaves. You abstain from accepting livestock. You abstain from accepting fields and land. You abstain from going on errands and running messages. You abstain from buying and selling. You abstain from practicing fraud. You abstain from accepting bribes, deceiving, defrauding and trickery. You abstain from wounding, murdering, imprisoning, extortion, plunder and violence. So there was a very early just form of you know, what was expected of someone who'd left the world, a monastic. And it was even 
people say just even earlier than what became known as the monastic rules. And so you can see just this is a virtue which people expect of you. And you know, if you are even just mentioning the word monk or nun, you know, even if you have no idea what Buddhism is, there's something about a monk or nun renouncing the world that, you know, this is what you would expect of them. Any comment on that? Contentment. I just, I remember this, there was a monk in South, in Thailand. He used to be a forest monk and somebody came up to me once, this is when I was still in Thailand a long time ago, they said it's so, so sad about, so that uh, Ajahn, what's his name? And they said, oh, well, what's happened to him? He's always got TB. They said, TB, it doesn't matter, that's curable these days. You know, causing antibiotics and it can cure TB. He said, no, you didn't hear properly. He's got TV <laughs> in his cootsie. <laughs> And that, I said, okay, I can't cure that one. <laughs> Contentment. You become content with the patch robes to protect your body. Can you, can you show off your patch robes, please? What you got on your, your angst? No, your sabon. Yeah, I'm good on today. No, I'll bring my dress robe. Dress, oh, dress robe, that is a dress robe. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we used to, Ajahn Bamali, he used to have his Sangati, had so many patches on it. And he kept on patching it, and in the end I had to ask him, look, Ajahn Bamali, look, you know, we'll get you another, you can use that in the monastery, but when you go traveling overseas, please, you know, put on a robe, otherwise people will say, um, Venerable Sir, you know, have you got any money with you? Because that's one of the, they used to have that as the rules. You know, in, in the customs could ask you, you know, how can you support yourself? And if you say, well, I've got no money. And they said, well, you know, you can't come in the country. You can't prove that you can support yourself. So I said, look, you know, at least you know, put on some, just to get through immigration and customs, and then you can wear your rag robes another time. <laughs> this I mean, I reminded people about this story when I was in Thailand just recently, last, um, when was it, last uh, February. Because I had a whole group of these disciples of our forest tradition, and they were going off to, I think, to Chithurst to do a katina ceremony. And that's in a monastery in Sussex. And so a whole heap of them, they decided, okay, eight precepts, so they took off all their jewelry and all of their uh, makeup and stuff, and they wore these really simple robes, you know, just like you, know, you see eight preceptors, just white uh, here and sort of a black uh, skirt, they're called brahmachari in Thai. So they wore such simple stuff, and they went to the British M consulate to get their visas. And they said, no, we're not giving you a visa. You know, you're not going there, you're just housemaids. Because that's what they look like in Thai culture, just housemaids, no makeup, no jewelry. And so they couldn't argue, we go to a temple, they didn't understand that. So they went home, got dressed up, <laughs> lots of makeup, jewellery and stuff, and they got their visa without any question. <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> you know, you've got to sort of be culturally appropriate. <laughs> that was really funny then when they told me. Anyway, so when you follow the noble, okay, contentment, you become content with patch rows to protect your body, with arms food to maintain your stomach. And wherever you go, you travel taking only these with you, just as a bird wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden. And you know, I've often thought about that, going, walking through Thailand, just your bowl and your robes and hardly anything else, and just, oh, it's just like being a burden. Just wander, you know, no, nothing to tie you down. And it was used to be great as a monk because you can go anywhere. And you can sleep out in the paddy fields, people know about you, and if you want to get some real solitude, you go into the cremation grounds, and no one would ever disturb you there because I was so afraid of ghosts. And the ghosts were afraid of me, so I had a lovely solitude in those places that left me alone. <laughs> and just walking wherever you want to go, you, always in the morning you get enough food to, to walk the rest of the distance, whichever way you want. So I like that idea of having just few possessions. Especially just, 
and I try to set the standard when I go traveling just to have just a very, very small amount of baggage so you can just go. Oh, I like that. Anyway, where are we going? Um, restraint, no, no, contentment. Wherever you go, you travel taking only these with you. When you follow this noble virtue and contentment, you know, content with little, you experience within yourself a delightful bliss, the joy of being blameless. Now this is this gradual training. Deeper and deeper happiness comes up. In other words, that you're such a good spirit, good um, uh, precepts, harmless, a little amount of things, a very soft footprint on our world. A few stuff, few things. You're so peaceful. It's a joy just to be free of all these burdens. And you're a good person. If you practice virtue, there's a happiness comes with it. And a contentment with little. And then restraint of the senses. Having, when you see an object, you do not let yourself get sucked in by marks and features that generate defilements. Since you've left the faculty of sight unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom when seeing. You guard the faculty of sight and you undertake the restraint of sight. So you see something you really like or someone really upsets you, you know, just, you restrain them. Don't look at its marks and features which actually excites you. And of course, when I became a monk, I was a very young man, believe it or not. There's actually some photos of me as a young monk in a book coming out from Wat Bao Pong. And of course, you know, you saw a beautiful girl and you know, you were subject to lust. So my way of dealing with that, I would, my way, okay, look for her pimples. And I'd always see, you know, ah, there it is. There's always something which was imperfect. Because, you know, the guy's idea was, oh, she's so wonderful, she's perfect. And just focusing on the imperfect would mean that you stop the lust and the desire. And this was for a young guy, okay. And whenever you saw someone who really upset you, you look for the beautiful features in them. So that way, you know, you restrain the senses by just looking not just what you wanted to see, but what balanced your view of a person. So they weren't beautiful, they weren't ugly, they were just a human being, that's all. So you're not accentuating just what you really want to see. Or when you have ill will, you're not just seeing, ah, oh, yeah, I was right, they are a BAS, whatever the rest of the word is. So the same with hearing a sound, having noticed a smell, having sensed a taste, having felt a bodily feeling, having cognized something in the mind, you do not let yourself get sucked in by marks and features that generate defilements, since if you left the mind faculty unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom with the mind, you guard the mind, and you undertake restraint of the mind. When you follow this noble restraint of the senses, you experience within yourself an even more delightful, even more delightful bliss, sorry, the joy of being unagitated. That's our Bayasekara Sukha. So this is getting some happiness coming in. And I should have said before that when you have the confidence, that is starting to get, because you have the learning, you teach it to Dharma and you, you listen to it, and that's where you get the right view. The virtue, that becomes the right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And the contentment, uh, patch robes, the simplicity there, that's a little bit of right livelihood. Restraint of the senses comes from the right, uh, right endeavor and some right mindfulness. But the mindfulness is really coming up next. So restraint of the senses, that's like the sixth factor of the Eightfold Path. Restraint, so defilements don't come up. So clear comprehension, but just practicing this, if you practice it properly, you get beautiful happiness, simplicity. You act in full comprehension of the purpose 
when going forward and returning, you're acting full comprehension of the purpose, when looking ahead, looking away, when flexing, extending your limbs, when wearing your clothes and carrying things, you're acting full comprehension of the purpose regarding eating and drink, drinking. Sorry. Uh, eating and drinking. I oh, right, yeah. Defecating and urinating, walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, being awake, talking, keeping silent. So this becomes, you know, part of the seventh factor, the satipatthana, meditation. When you have developed this noble virtue, this noble restraint of the senses, and this noble clear comprehension, you go to a secluded dwelling place, such as a forest, the foot of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thick in an open space, a heap of straw. Those were the places where you could find solitude in those days. You sit down, folding your legs crosswise, straightening the body, establishing mindfulness as a priority. And now usually we go here, you start watching the breathing. Or you do something else, but this goes to the heart of it, abandoning the five senses. Five senses. Abandoning wanting, sorry, abandoning want the five hindrances, sorry. Abandoning wanting for the world of the five senses, you abide with a mind free from wanting. You purify the mind from desire. Abandoning aversion, you abide with a mind free from ill will. Compassionate for the welfare of all beings, you thus, and you're included there, you thus purify the mind from aversion. Abandoning dullness and drowsiness, you abide with a mind free from dullness and drowsiness. Bright-minded, clearly comprehending, you purify the mind from dullness and drowsiness. Abandoning restlessness and remorse, you abide unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. You purify your, the mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, you abide having gone beyond doubt. This is what it means by doubt. Unperplexed about wholesome states. Understand what is a good, what is going to be a problem. You purify the mind from doubt. So this is where we've restrained the five senses. And the result of that, the jhanas. Having abandoned the five hindrances, totally free from the five senses, free from unwholesome states, you enter upon the abide in the first jhana wherein the mind moves on to the object, holds on to it, the object being joy and pleasure caused by being totally free from the five senses. When the mind stops moving on to the object and stops holding on to it, you enter upon the abide in the second jhana which has trust in the object, the bliss, enough to let go of holding it and unity of mind without any movement or holding, with joy and pleasure caused by perfect stillness. With the fading away of joy, you are mindful and fully aware, experience a bliss purified from joy, still blissful but purified from joy, you enter upon the abide in the third jhana, on account of which no one's announced one has a pleasant abiding indeed, who has such mindfulness and equanimity. And having abandoned pleasure and pain, all vague enough from the five senses, with the disappearance of joy and grief, all vague enough from the sixth sense, except for equanimity. You enter upon the abide in the fourth jhana, which is only neutral mental vedana remaining, just pure mindfulness with equanimity. And that was the teaching of the gradual training. Apparently first taught when the uh, Samanya Pala Sutta, the fruits of the holy life, when uh, a king uh, Jata Satu, uh, he went to see the Buddha and said, well you're obviously royalty, why are you leading this harsh life? You could be living in the palace. You know, enjoying the best food, dancing girls, they didn't have TVs in those days, sex, whatever. Why, why are you doing this for? And the Buddha said, because this is greater happiness than you have. And he was arguing why it was greater happiness. And happiness, because this is a gradual training, you get more and more inspired. You get, so when you start keeping precepts, keeping those first factors of the, the virtue of the Eightfold Path, right speech, action, livelihood, and the right motivation behind it, four factors, that's where you get the blameless happiness. It's like, generally, just you're happier because uh, when you break precepts, it harms other people. It also harms yourself. So you're happier when you keep precepts. I always say that people say, oh, have a good time. 
This is a good time when you spend your holidays in a monastery rather than a pub, when you, you go to a retreat rather than a nightclub, when you get blissed out in jhanas rather than drugs. Good people have a good time. So, this is, and from there, the higher happiness of simplicity and the higher happiness of restraining the senses. So instead of allowing the senses to destroy your happiness by seeing whatever you want, hearing whatever you like, instead you restrain it, keep them inside, and it's a higher happiness, more joy. And because you restrain the senses, it's much easier to have the clear, or you have the joy being unagitated, a peaceful mind, not agitated by wanting this or getting upset at that. And from the clear comprehension, then you can do the abandoning of the five hindrances. If the five hindrances are abandoned, then jhana is just, just simple. When the five hindrances are abandoned, that the doors of jhana are wide, wide open. You go in there, of course you do. When the hindrances are there, that's what stops you entering the jhanas. So anyway, there we have the gradual training, a parallel to the Eightfold Path. Again, taught by the Buddha. Any questions or comments? So, <laughs> that's a nice comment, thank you. Okay, I have a few questions. Uh, I just, uh, I have to leave by, at least by 4, 20, 25, because, oh, I have to go to church today. <laughs> it's Sunday. Now every year they have an interfaith service. So I put my name down to that. We're supposed to be starting at 5 o'clock. We should go there at 4.45 anyway. 4.30 may be okay. From USA, what advice would the Buddha give to lay Buddhists who don't have much time to meditate but still at least want to put their best foot forward towards stream entry? You do have time to meditate. It's just grabbing that time, giving it importance. If it's in USA, if it is, oh, what is a Super Bowl or something? People always find time to watch football. They always have time to watch the last episode of, I don't know, Friends or Seinfeld or something. If it's important, you can always find the time. So I remember just, <laughs> because you were laughing, I remember going to Adelaide once and no, not so many people turned up to the temple when I was giving a talk. I said, why? I said, oh, I was really badly scheduled because today, exactly when I was giving my talk, there was a one-day cricket international between Australia and Sri Lanka in Adelaide. So I said, well, look, you know, you know I know Sri Lankan people. <laughs> my talk can be videoed, they can see it in the next one. So next time, please don't schedule it <laughs> the same day. <laughs> you buy me another time. <laughs> but you see, when people really want to do something, of course they can find the time. So, if you don't have much time to meditate, do you have much time to eat? And that great little story of the guy who was working, he was, I think, where, was it New York? I think it was New York, who told me that he finds time in his busy life to meditate one hour every day. Except when he's busy. And when he's busy, he meditates two hours a day. <laughs> because he needs to be precise, he needs to be really sort of productive. He can't afford to make mistakes when he hasn't got much time. And his meditation clears his mind, focuses his mind, and he becomes far more productive. So if you haven't got much time, you must use it wisely. So if you practice a meditation, it actually makes time. Harvard Business School calls it an investment of time. How can you make sure you really have a peaceful mind and not suppress hindrance into your subconscious? What part of the mind is the subconscious? Can I make that peaceful too? As you become more mindful, more aware, that subconscious processes start to open up to you. You understand how your mind works. Just like when the lights are out, you can't see very much, but once you turn the lights on, or once the dawn comes, the sun comes up, and it goes to high noon, especially in Australia in the summertime, it's so bright. 
So that's where you can start to see you know, the so-called subconscious, when the mind is very bright, you can see everything. Especially you can see just now your habits and stuff, which you know, just uh, the subconscious acting underneath, you can start to be aware of it. And have a peaceful mind, not suppress hindrances. The hindrances aren't supposed to be suppressed, it's called restrained. Suppressing is not acknowledging them even, that they exist. I'm not angry, not me, no, not me. <laughs> That's called suppression. And just restraining is, yeah, I'm angry, now what am I going to do about it? I'm going to make sure that, ah, oh, come and let it go, give people the benefit of the doubt, they didn't really mean that, misunderstandings. So it's not helping me to get angry, just, you know, it's not good for... So, after a while you can let go of the anger, by understanding and not suppressing. Suppressing is willpower. Freedom is from wisdom power. So the, that's why you, you don't suppress it you, from will. You actually understand it through wisdom. And of course you can make everything peaceful. And lastly, in environments of high stress and violence it can be hard to meditate. It's a particular technique one can use to settle down, kind of a pre-meditation method. That's a very good question. You know, sometimes people are really highly stressed. You know, sometimes, you know, even people ask me, and I said, fair enough, you know, listen to some, some quiet music, first of all. You just come home from work, you know, not sort of uh, death metal or gangster rap or anything which is even like um, uh, rock music, but something which calms you down a little bit. And then maybe even more calm, not for entertainment's sake, but just to settle you down. Find a nice quiet place to meditate, that really helps. You have a place where you can go. And then you can settle down. Remember just what happens before you sit on your cushion is also really important. So I often mention, I should mention that more often on a Saturday afternoon, when you come in here to meditate, if you've been arguing with somebody, rushing around, out there, of course, you know, it's going to take you a time to, to settle down. You know, that's one of the reasons why that when we teach a meditation here, especially on a Saturday afternoon, I do 15 minutes of talking first of all, just before we start meditating on a Saturday afternoon. People said, oh, why can't we just start meditating straight away? That 15 minutes is not just to give you some instructions, it's just calm people down, settle people down, from just rushing sometimes to get here on time doing stuff, so you can be peaceful. So, any questions from the floor here? Why didn't I say from the from the seats, not just the floor, <laughs> from the cushions? Yeah, just quickly, Abraham Brown. Um, my brother suffers with uh, paraphobia. I don't know if you've heard of this before. With it's what? A, a paraphobia, which is a fear of infinity. Um, it's fear a, of a fear of infinity. A fear of infinity. Yeah. Wow. It afflicts a very small number of people, but it's essentially it's not so much the the fear of death, but the fear of the eternal reincarnation, or the fear of an eternal heaven realm, or something like this. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was just thinking, is there anything, any advice that you could give to such people oh, um, yeah. in order to help ease their suffering? Um, the only suffering? Reason. I think I'm right behind them. <laughs> That's wisdom, not suffering. <laughs> so, yeah, you've got a problem there, we'll do something about it. Hmm. So it's like a fear of light. It's a fear of darkness, so turn on the light. So, see if you can learn what makes infinity happen. Mm. What makes things endless? Why does it go on? Mm. And of course, you can find out the main thing is wanting. Wanting causes this world to go round and round and round and round. Mm. I quite liked um, Ajahn Chah's analogy yeah. of still flowing water. Yeah, I yeah. So, good. see if that water could fall down the sinkhole and disappear forever. Okay, so uh, we have to end now because otherwise I'll get into trouble. <coughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, sometimes I've got that fear of infinity, the talk goes on forever and ever and ever. Maybe <laughs> it's best to put a dumb sangha. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagawa Udang Bhagawanda 
Abi Wadehi. Suakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammanamasami. Supatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami.